Hey, Red Eye. Uh, my name is Drew Goddard. I'm the director of the upcoming movie Cabin in the Woods in theaters April 13th. I know you sort of wanted to make a conscious effort not to suggest that you were condescending to the genre conventions that come along, but as someone who obviously does have such a passion for the genre, like how much frustration is there? I mean, even even I in the as a, in the role of a critic, when I sit through something that is so generic in any genre, I just like, oh, we've seen this a billion times before. That's right. So yeah. how much frustration is there when you just kind of see the same thing over and over? Again? Yeah, I mean, tremendous. And and you know, the thing that bothers me the most is you can really tell when a director or, or filmmakers in general just don't care <laughs> about their subjects, about either their genre or their characters. And it just if a filmmaker doesn't care about his characters. It just it just pollutes the whole movie, you know. And so that's I think when that happens, that's when cliched stuff starts to happen because now characters aren't even acting like characters; they start acting like your puppets. Right. They start acting like the director's puppets to just do puppety things and then <laughs> and then be done with. And that's the thing when I, I notice the most that bothers me the most. So how how can you tell? You say it's so easy to tell when they don't care. I don't. I mean, it's instinct, I guess. I mean, I don't know that there. It's not like there's a clue that you you. You can just tell when they don't care. It's like the, the deaths become arbitrary. The deaths become fetishized. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, that guy's dead. Let, oh, move on. You know, like there's not, there's not a sense of that uh, these people are real people. I wonder what would it be like if someone took a Cabin in the Woods style approach to a different genre. Uh, we, Joss and I talk about that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like, what are those conversations like? You know, we would love to do you know Cabin in the Woods, but with the romantic comedy, <laughs> <laughs> just sort of see that same sort of manipulation because that's a genre that I think the romantic comedy has become a little stale uh, in the last ten years, and and I, it's a genre I love, and I would love to see somebody do it right again. So what do you think you would be playing off of the most? I don't really know. <laughs> I don't really. I haven't really thought about it too much, but it would be fun to put them through a ringer. When you look at the types of people in Cabin in the Woods and you know, the athlete, the whore, the virgin, the way that it breaks down demographically, it reminded me of The Breakfast Club. Right. How much? Uh, to what extent should we see that as a horror movie? Well, it's funny because I think you know one of the uh, things that we, at the core of Cabin is that. As Kevin goes, it expands, so it's not just about horror movies anymore, and it's about it's about mythology, and it's about archetypes and, and archetypes and mythology that we've had since the beginning of time, mm -hmm. and that those archetypes. Once you start recognizing the archetypes, you can spot them in in most genres. You know, you can spot them, and it's not just in the horror genre. You spot them in the comedy genre. You you spot them in a romantic comedy. You spot them in things like The Breakfast Club. Like archetypes are archetypes for a reason. They 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 happen. They tell us something about ourselves, and that was the question of why. Why do we create these mythologies? Uh, is a question that was very much at the heart of this movie. I have to say, I think I would like The Breakfast Club better if zombies came out <laughs> of the gym and just started attacking everybody. Very few movies would not be uh, made better if zombies <laughs> were suddenly added in the middle of them. What are the exceptions? I was going to say terms of endearment, but terms of endearment I think would actually be better if some zombies showed up. So none. The answer is none. They'd all be better. Well, clearly with these, I forget the exact titles, but like the Jane Austen and Don right. Prime Prejudice and zombies and things like that, what do you make of, of these mashup stories that seem to be coming along? You, you know, it, it always comes down to execution. You know, like some of your favorite movies, if you heard them in one line form, you would go, before they'd come out, you would go, well, that movie sounds terrible. <laughs> but, but then it's done well, and you're like, oh, that, is, that this movie is great. So it just, if they do it well, it, there's no bad ideas. And if, if it's terrible, uh, no amount of the idea can save it. <laughs> Um, why do you think, you know, obviously both you and Joss from your work on Buffy and Angel and, and Cloverfield, everything you guys have done has this, like, intensely rabid audience. Why do you think what is commonly referred to as geek culture, whatever it may be, why do you think these fans are so incredibly passionate? I guess I can speak to why we're passionate about Joss, because I started as a fan of Joss, you know, like that. You know, I came to Buffy late, and I came because... When I was in college, I saw the first episodes of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and it felt like a bomb went off. It felt like, oh, somebody is actually doing it better. Someone has figured out a new form of storytelling, sure. and they're mixing the things I love together in a, in a new way. And I, it was like nothing I had ever seen. It made me rethink what I wanted to do with my life, because suddenly I felt like, between that and The X-Files, quite frankly, it felt like all the best stuff was being done in television. It felt like far more interesting genre stuff was actually happening mm -hmm. uh, in television at that time. And so... 
I just studied him, and I think the thing, the secret to his success is he cares about his characters more than anyone I've ever seen. Like he loves his characters, and he works so hard to make sure you empathize with them and you can emotionally relate to them. And when that happens, you can tell any kind of story you want. If your characters work and you love them and you relate to them, you can go to the farthest ends of the world. You can do the most ridiculous things. I mean, mm -hmm. on Buffy Nature, we did some ridiculous storytelling that we should not have been able to do, but because it was always grounded in what these characters were going through and always relatable and always worked, and I think people respond to that. I think that's why they become members of your family, and, and that's why people get so passionate. Obviously, we there's a lot that we can't talk about about Cabin in the Woods. Um, so much of the fun is the surprise. Right. Um, but as you guys were developing the movie and then shot the last 20 minutes especially right. was there a, a voice in your head that was like our fan base is going to absolutely devour this <laughs> I, I don't know no it was more we are going to devour this like, we really, <laughs> both Jaws and I were like this is it this is our ticket to finally do something we've always wanted to do and put something on the screen that has never been put on the screen before and that's exciting like when you know like you've stumbled onto something new it's always it's always invigorating. What's a scary encounter that you've had in the movie? There's the towards the beginning they meet up with the creepy guy at the gas station. Right. It's kind of like, well, here's something that always happens. Have you had any moments in your own life where you met somewhere like, oh, this is a horror cliche? Uh oh. <laughs> I'm sure I have. That's a good question. <laughs> uh, well, let me think about that one. I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, okay. Like, have you, when you were growing up, was there something in particular that tended to scare you? Yeah, it's scary movies. I mean, scary movies. It was very hard for me to watch horror movies. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was, I was, I was a kid that, I still sort of am that kid where I can't quite differentiate between my imagination and what's real. <laughs> and it was much stronger as a kid. Um, and so I really believed that Jason was out there hacking people up with machetes. I really believed it. I really believed that there was an alien that could impregnate me and cause something to burst out of my chest. So I would watch these things and then just be emotionally scarred. It wasn't until I was like 18 or 19 that I was able to sort of start knowing the difference. But I still get scared. I watched The Descent and I almost had to leave the theater because I was so scared. <laughs> like it still happens to me. Do you have any memories of, of being young watching, you know, Jason and, and these other killers on screen and like what actually happened to you? Did you, you know... I remember, you know, there was a lot of sleepovers. You know, kids, you know, kids would have slumber parties, and there. And I remember one night, a kid was like, "Let's watch all the Friday the Thirteenth movies, so we all have nightmares." And I remember thinking, "That's a terrible idea. <laughs> like, who wants to have nightmares? That sounds awful. I hate nightmares." And I remember having to just watch. But everyone, of course, was like, "Yeah, yeah let's watch that." I, I, mean, I spent like six hours with just my sleeping bag over my head because I didn't want to watch, and I was so scared. So just six hours in a sleeping bag listening to just horrible murder happening is a, is a long time. <laughs> and did you have nightmares that night? No, because I didn't watch. <laughs> I managed to protect myself. If you could be killed by any particular monster, which one would you want it to be? One of mine or just any uh, monster? Anyone. Uh, you'd want it to be somebody fast. Someone who doesn't, you know, isn't about torturing and making it. So who's quick and to the point? Um, maybe Michael Myers. He doesn't seem to torture too much. He's just down for the kill. And you want it, you want it to be fast and, and to the point. So you respect the humanity of a quick killer. I don't even know if it's, a, if it's coming from a humanity place. I just, <laughs> I just appreciate it that I'm not being, you know... Like, Freddy Krueger would be a terrible way to die, because you're having to experience a lengthy nightmare before you get killed and tortured. That's a good point.